Welcome to this presentation. My name is Daniel Portolani. I am a queer transgender therapist and sex counselor and my pronouns are he, him and they, them. This presentation is part of my final assignment for the Pink Therapy Case Diploma in GSLD Therapy. As a trigger warning, please note this presentation is explicit and talks about suicide and suicidality in the transgender population. Please take your time to go through it and take as many pauses as you need to take care of yourself. The American Psychological Association defines suicide as the act of killing oneself and suicidality as the risk of killing oneself. Suicidality can look like a lot of things. Suicidal ideation is a broad term used to describe a range of contemplations, wishes and preoccupations with death and suicide. Suicidal intent is the desire or motivation to carry through with ideation. Suicidal planning is the formulation of a method for which one intends to die. A suicidal attempt is an engagement in self-injurious behavior with some intent to die. Most clinicians uh, distinguish suicidal behavior from non-suicidal self-injury defined as the intentional self-inflicted destruction of body tissue without suicidal intention. Every suicidal thought and behavior must be taken seriously and so does non-suicidal self-injury as research identifies it as a risk factor for suicide. When we talk about suicide words matter, you can follow the reference in the slide to find guidelines on how to talk about suicide in the LGBTQ community. According to WHO, uh, suicide is a public health priority, as more than 700,000 people take their own life every year. Research shows that people with marginalized identities are more vulnerable to self-harm and suicide. Suicide rates are more prevalent among the transgender population where compared to both the general and the LGB one. According to the US Transgender Survey, 82% of transgender individuals have considered killing themselves and 40% have attempted suicide, which is nine times greater than the general population rate. For a detailed analysis, you can follow the reference in the slide. Trans youth are particularly at risk of suicide as confirmed by the Travel Project's 2022 mental health survey. Suicide is never an intrinsic feature of an identity or a consequent and natural reaction to a situation. It is a complex behavior involving multiple overlapping causes and resulting for the complicated interaction of biological, psychological, cognitive and environmental factors. The processes by which some but not all distressed people feel suicidal are complex, uh, contextual and non-static. Suicide-related disparities are also intersectional, as the interaction of identities, personal backgrounds and social and relational contexts can modulate risk and protective factors in one's ways. It's also useful to understand that suicide is not about wanting to die, uh, it is an attempt made by the person to seek a solution for a problem they find overwhelming, constrictive and entrapping while feeling all possibilities have been exhausted. Part of our work is about helping clients to open up new possibilities and to develop skills and find new strategies to face the situation. Addressing suicide in trans clients requires an additional layer of competence as you need to know their unique risk and protective factors the nuanced pathways that might make them feel hopeless, and the viable strategies to deal with this in an affirmative way. Suicide rate disparities between the trans and the general population are being constantly explained through uh, Myers Minority Stress Model and its adaptation by Testa and colleagues. Trans people experience additional and evitable chronic, unique and socially based stresses such as gender-based discrimination, victimization, rejection, and identity non-affirmation. These distal factors cause internal or proximal stressors such as anticipated stigma, internalized transphobia, non-disclosure of one's identity, and passing-related stress. Distal and proximal stressors can be modulated by individual or relational resilience factors such as identity pride or family and community support. 
Research shows that the interplay between personal features, minority stresses, and motivating factors accounts for disparities in mental and physical health outcomes, including suicidality. The minority stress framework, however, does not specify the pathways by which this happens, and it's not predictive. Minority stress research can be complemented by general suicide theories. The most recent models on suicide posit an ideation to action framework as they hypothesize that the factors leading to suicidal thinking and behavior in action can be distinguished. The interpersonal psychological theory of suicide aims to explain interpersonal pathways leading to suicide and posits that suicidal ideation is influenced by thwarted belongingness, that is perceived social isolation and detachment, and perceived burdensomeness, that is, individuals believe that their existence is a burden to others or a feeling of self-hatred. Suicidal attempts can happen when one feels hopeless and have acquired the capability of suicide, uh, that is a condition marked by fearlessness and pain tolerance developed through repeated exposure to negative experiences. The integrated motivational volitional model of suicidal behavior explains the transition from ideation to enactment. It describes the biopsychosocial context in which suicidality may emerge, the factors that actually lead to ideation and intent, and the ones that can translate them into a suicidal attempt. Suicidal ideation is the outcome of a process beginning with feelings of defeat and humiliation, which can be facilitated by individual dispositions, life events, and a hostile sociocultural context. In some situations, defeat can lead to a feeling of no perceived escape. The transition from entrapment to ideation is moderated by factors that allow to see alternatives and a more positive future. Belongingness and connectedness are among these. Conversely, uh, feeling a burden, having little social support and depleted resilience will increase the likelihood of suicidal ideation. A past history of self-harm, access to means, fearlessness about death and exposure to suicide can translate it into action. Minority stress shows that transgender people face higher rates of discrimination and victimization and how this facilitates um, unemployment, isolation, negative expectations of the future, self-stigma, exposure to violence and suicide, harmful coping mechanisms such as substance use and self-harm, and so on. Suicide theories can help us understanding how these factors play a part in suicidal and help-seeking behaviors and how they can be targeted. You can find more articles using these frameworks together in the slide. The trans community holds resiliency factors that need to be increased with culturally sensitive suicidal uh, prevention strategies. Family support and validation, connection with the trans community, timely access to gender affirmative treatment and correct name and pronouns use are protective factors against suicide. In our everyday affirmative work with transgender people, we are actually working on preventing suicide. Literature shows that therapy is effective in reducing suicidal ideation and attempts, but uh, working with suicidal clients is not easy and 90% of clients claim, um, of clinicians, I'm sorry, claimed uh, client suicide to be their greatest fear. Many of them feel confused or hopeless in the face of its personal, professional, and legal consequences and become unsure, overly cautious, fearful, and ultimately feel unprepared. Indeed, uh, there is no magical one right way to treat suicidal clients or to act in every situation. Each client is in a different position and for every decision in clinical practice there are potential risks and benefits. The ethical treatment of suicidality requires us to negotiate a delicate balance between respecting our client's autonomy on their own life and providing care. We can be as helpful as they allow. However, it is our obligation to do everything we can to assess suicidality risk 
and to carry out a plan to address it. In order to work with suicidal clients in the best and safest way, we need to develop both technical competence and self-awareness and tools to manage our own uh, emotional distress. Effective suicide uh, treatment involves knowledge and skills in systematic risk assessment, formulation and management. Literature shows that therapists are not trained enough and that lack of competence enhances fear, anxiety, self-doubts and false beliefs and ultimately increases avoidance as it prevents from feeling confident enough to talk about suicide with clients. And this is a problem as suicide has largely been a taboo topic. Clients often first reference their suicidal thoughts during the session in implicit ways. Queer people find it especially hard to talk about suicide because of factors such as uh, internalized phobias, societal stigmas, pathology narratives and negative experiences from health professionals. As such, our confidence to be willing to openly and non-judgmentally deal with the topic is essential. The fear that talking about suicide will prove the thought in your client's mind is a false myth. By not discussing suicide, we intensify secrecy, shame and self-stigma, which are already heavily present in TGD clients. Talking about it can feel as permission and provides clients with a safe space to explore their feelings, which is often met with relief. It also allows us to explore how they can keep themselves safe and identify ways in which they can manage suicidal thoughts. This is a checklist I found useful to self-assess my competence in suicide treatment. You can ask yourself questions as you go through it and find areas in which you need to improve or be supervised. You might also want to ask yourself how these are informed by a culturally competent stance and tailored to your clients. If you work with T people, uh, you need to know their specific risk and protective factors and how can you work in a realistic and viable ways. In example, uh, it's not enough to know that sport prevents depression in the general population if your client can't access gyms or sport teams due to their identity. Crisis helplines, emergency contacts in a safety plan, but also self-help groups and communities need to be affirmative of your client's specific identity and you must make sure the ones locally available are viable and safe space for them to be referred to. And this doesn't stop as, uh, at their gender identity, but encompasses all their intersections. T people are also uh, neurodivergent, uh, disabled, and so on. And you want to make sure the resources and tools you are using are suitable for them. In forms, notes, uh, consulting, and reporting, it is important to think about how to avoid both misgendering and outing your client, and so on. Clinicians can experience a range of emotions when working with suicidal clients, including a fear, anger, intrusive thoughts, and a sense of incompetence. Commitment and a sense of responsibility can lead to high expectation and contribute to feeling overwhelmed and hopeless. It's important to acknowledge our reactions and to take precautions so, so they don't impact on our ability to give help. Consultation, supervision, and conscious self-care are your best tools to deal with these. In literature, you can find many concepts to describe the uh, occupational hazards that can occur when working with suicidal clients. Some of these can partially overlap depending on the sources you find and they are not mutually exclusive. Trauma theorists have coined concepts like uh, secondary traumatic stress and vicarious trauma to describe the range of symptoms that providers may experience in working with those reporting traumatic events. Vicarious trauma includes uh, changes in beliefs about one's sense of self, one's safety in the world, and the trustworthiness of others, and might require professional care. Burnout is different. Uh, it results from accumulated occupational stress and encompasses emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced sense of efficacy and personal accomplishment. Uh, in this slide, you might find some of the most common signs you can detect uh, in your everyday work. 
Mm. Managing burnout is part of an effective and ethical care as it is associated with uh, poor decision making and with not being cognizant about mistakes. As Dr. Megan Newsom says, if it takes you more than 30 seconds to answer to the question, what is the last thing you've done to take care of yourself lately, you can do better. In this slide, uh, you can find some tips you might want to consider to help you uh, self-care and prevent occupational hazards. You might want to pause the presentation to make sure you go through all of them and res resume it when you're ready. If you are a trans therapist working with uh, trans clients, you might want to consider how your intersectional position influences the way you feel when you're both in the room and out there living your everyday life. Minority stressors uh, are a thing and research identifies being previously victimized and sharing an identity with clients as risk factors for developing uh, vicarious trauma. You might, think, uh, you might need to think about how you balance uh, living and working in the same community, whether community resources are fully available and accessible for you, and what does this mean for your resilience and coping skills. The intersection of these stresses and risk factors is usually not included in therapists' educational and research settings and advocates for the need of dedicated self-reflection and supervision. In this slide, you can find some questions you may find useful to ask yourself on this topic. Pause the video for as much time as you need. This presentation is just a brief overview and many topics and data remain uncovered. So uh, you might follow the references to know more and thank you for your attention.